are going through our study, our introduction into our study of Genesis. You can go ahead and turn there. Now, this is going to make some of you feel super old. Yeah, who loves that, right? It's been over 25 years since the last episode, not the first, the last episode of Seinfeld aired. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Oh my goodness. Uh, how many of you guys like Seinfeld? Anybody like Seinfeld? Yeah. Um, it's a classic American TV show. And part of what made Seinfeld such a hit was the emphasis on the absurdities of life, the randomness of just how things can come about in our life. Just four friends, four quirky, unique individual friends going through what would normally, you know, be trivial and mundane, uh, but, but the funny and crazy things that can happen when you're getting soup, you know, or uh, puffy shirts or licking stamps or all of those things. And if you are a fan of the TV show, you know that George actually pitched the show to the execs as a show about nothing. Right? A show with no plot and no point. And that may work well for a TV show, but that's a terrible way to live one's life. But that is unfortunately how many people are living their life today. Just walking, talking, living, breathing Seinfelds, going from, from one scene to another, from one moment to another, entertaining ourselves along the way, but never considering, what's the point? What's this about? Why do I exist? What is, what is life and why do I have one? I, it's funny for a show, but it's sad when that's the reality because it has drastic consequences in our life. It's a matter of worldview. Everyone has a worldview. A worldview is, you ready for this? It's your view of the world. Yeah. You can write that down. But, you know, we understand that, but what is our worldview? And sometimes we, we can't even understand or, or acknowledge maybe what our own worldview is. But by answering a couple questions, you can usually discover what your worldview is. And those questions are how we believe that we came to be. You know, how, how did I get here? How did things get? How did I get the way I am? How did this situ we find ourselves in this situation? And where are we headed? The answer to these questions that we have for these questions, that forms our core beliefs, it forms our, our values, and our shapes our attitudes, and it's from that belief that we determine our behavior and how we're going to live our life. And so Christianity, I believe, has the, the best answer to those questions. How we believe we came to be is that we are a unique creation of a holy and righteous God, and we were created in his image. And then how did things get the way they are? Well, we're a fallen creatures. We're rebellious by nature. We want to live in our natural man in autonomous from God, separate from him. I don't want God to rule over me. I want to do this myself. And what's that is created is a world full of sin and hurt and pain and all of these other things. And then third, how, where are we headed? Well, through the saving work of Jesus, who has paid the price for not only my sins, but the sins of the whole world. He's offered forgiveness, and someday all of creation will one day be restored. That's a, you know, a biblical worldview. But understanding those things and be that belief of that is understood by less and less folks in the world today. A recent study, a, few, a couple years ago, a Barna study revealed that only 4% of U.S. Americans have a biblical worldview. That the, the Word of God is their basis on how they determine uh, what they're going to do and the decisions that they make in life. Only 4 out of 100 people say, this has the answers to how I'm going to form my belief system. And that's scary that only four out of a hundred people think that. But what's more alarming even to me is that this study found in the process of the study that 
Even amongst religious people, this survey discovered that only 9% of those who say they're born again live in light of a a biblical decision-making process. Those who attend mainline Protestant churches, 2%. Within the Catholic Church, less than one half of 1%. The church groups that had the highest percentage of adults that formed their biblical worldview, you know, their worldview through the Bible, were Baptist churches, were 8%, Pentecostal churches, 10%, and then non denominational churches were at 13%. But all of that worldview conversation starts with the first words of Genesis. It starts with Genesis 1.1. And it's a simple verse. It's 10 words long, but it's profound. And it offers this foundation for a biblical worldview. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a simple statement. Uh, most of us have it memorized, you know, we knew it before we came in here, but it's packed with, with import and impact. And it's been rightly said that if you believe that one verse, Genesis 1-1, then you won't have a problem with the 31,101 other verses in the Bible. If you're like, I accept that, then everything else, you, you know, you're going you're gonna to accept. But what about when it comes to mankind? I want you to look down to verses 26 and 27 the final acts of creation, the final thing being created on the sixth day, the crowning piece of all creation. This is in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to Our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, the past couple weeks, if we've been making this introduction into Genesis, we've talked about the existence of God. We've talked about his nature, his attributes. What's he like? What is, what is God? But what about us? Now we need to talk about us. Like, what is humanity? What's, what's the purpose in life? What am I here for? And the answer to those questions can't be found outside of understanding where we began by understanding our origins. You have to deal and have to come to a determination on Genesis 1.1. Because belief in the text of Genesis sets the foundation for the rest of your worldview. As I mentioned uh, the past last week, the greatest scientists of history have all been those with a biblical worldview. Uh, Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, Galileo, Pascal, Da Vinci, Roger Bacon, no relation to Jimmy Dean, but a pretty bright guy apparently. In fact, Louis Pasteur claimed science brings men nearer to God. That was a general consensus of the scientific revolution uh, of of modern scientific thought was that science and a biblical understanding go hand in hand. Now, they began to deviate. They diverged from one another in the 1800s. That's when this belief that science and Christianity go from being complementary to no, science and religion must be contradictory. And that's what's foisted upon us, that that somehow they're in competition with one another. And so these questions, how did we come to be? Uh, You know, how did we get to where we are and where are we headed? The answers to those questions aren't found in a science book. They're found in this book. Now, when, when this book addresses things of science, as we said, it's always correct. And if you weren't here this past Wednesday, I encourage you to, to go check out that message. We, we talked about the reliability of Scripture and how we can understand and know that it's trustworthy to, to base our lives on. But this isn't a science book. This is a soul book. And so this is the book that tells us the answer about us. Now, of these predominant worldviews that are out there, as they attempt to answer these questions... Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I headed? These 
ideologies can be uh, divided in two ways. Either man was created by God or man evolved as a product of natural processes over billions of years, and that's what brought us to this place. Okay? Now, it's been said that if evolution were true, moms would have four arms, right? And uh, God bless moms. But what you believe on this issue is not secondary. It's, it's foundational. If we believe in an infinite, righteous, holy, moral, personal God, and that he reveals himself and the truth about who he is and his heart for humanity and you specifically is revealed here, that biblical worldview is going to affect how I live and how I view the world around me, even in the natural world. For example, how many of you guys have been to the Grand Canyon? Okay. It's pretty grand. If you ever try to drive around it, like you find out the hard way that it's pretty grand, okay? The evolutionary worldview would say that, you know, over a period of 200 million to 2 billion years, the Colorado River, that little river right there in the middle, slowly cut away all of that sediment and then deposited all of that sediment in the Gulf of California, okay? Whereas a biblical worldview, as I understand that this is where God reveals truth about humanity and all of those things, then I understand, well, most likely the Grand Canyon was formed quickly by water rushing and gushing, you know, and and washing away sediment incredibly fast and and ripping it out, right? And all of that can be explained uh, as part of the global flood. And we'll address some of that when we get into Genesis chapter 6. But a biblical worldview, it's going to affect how we look at and determine and understand and interpret the natural world. But it also when it comes to determining uh, morality and our viewpoints, what's right and wrong on the issues of today. When it comes to stuff like transgenderism or homosexuality or abortion or euthanasia or any of those things, if I have a biblical worldview, that's going to shape how I think about those. Okay, we can understand that. Well, the opposite is true too. The evolutionary viewpoint can also shape how we view those things. And if we just believe that there's nothing and then nothing exploded and created everything, well, that's certainly going to affect how I live my life and how I choose what's true and not true and, and what, you know, how I make those determinations. But that's, that's what we face. We're, we're inundated everywhere we turn with this old earth evolutionary model that, uh, you know, that this has all taken billions and billions of years and that we've come from lower, a lower species. Smart people believe this. Brilliant people, probably people in this room believe this. Your family believes this. Your friends believe this. But is Darwinian evolution a fact? And that's what I want to look at, just briefly, honestly, because there's folks that, that you know, spend their whole life's work addressing this. But I just have a few considerations this morning when it comes to evolution. Number one, is the first cause argument. Uh, There's the law of cause and effect. For every action or every effect, there's a cause that began it. That's a law of physics. And this goes, you you could take this back and back for this uh, effect. Well, something must have caused that. And if if we go back chronologically or to the edge of the universe, something brought us to this point. There had to be a first cause. And it's not just out of nothing, suddenly there's gases and anemo acids and proteins and and all of that just began. There has to be a first cause cause before all of that. That's just a law of nature. And, and you and I, we might get asked, as we do, well, what's God's first cause? Like, okay, I understand that. That makes sense. But what about God? He's God. He doesn't have a first cause. That's part of, if you were here last week, that's what defines him as God, is he's not us. He's, he's so different and apart from creation. He's God. So we don't have a problem with the first cause. He's before the first cause. Now, consideration number two is the fallacy that all you have to do is add more time to make evolution possible. And uh, as I looked up this morning, the, the latest estimates are it took four billion years to bring us to where we're at today. And, and I'll tell you, we talked about inflation recently. 
that number has inflated a lot since I was in school. It was like 1 million years. And so now it's 4 billion. And there's a big difference between 1 million and 4 billion. It just seems like such a random number. And that's part of it is because it's unfathomable number. And so like, yeah, just, we'll just say it's that. But when confronted with the impossibilities, like the, the law of cause and effect, that something had to begin all of this, all a Darwinian evolutionist can say is given enough time right? You just search online, it's given enough time, given enough time. That's the X in the algebra equation of origins. Nothing plus X, enough time, nothing plus enough time equals everything. Nothing plus enough time. Like how does, how does adding time to nothing, right? That that's enough to create our our universe and our complex human nature, just give it more time. But given enough time, nothing doesn't become everything. You can't just simply add more time. That doesn't create. More time itself does not create. If if this sanctuary was full of monkeys and typewriters, we would never come up with an episode of Seinfeld, let alone Shakespeare or a Bon Jovi song or something, you know, really incredible like that. Um, I'm joking. I said air supply in the last one, and that was a total dud, so I thought I would, not, not any air supply fans. But the thing is, you know, they say more time, but the, the truth of the matter is that if you continue to add more time, that begins to be a problem for Darwinian evolution. The sun, okay, is burning up mass every moment of every day. It's what energizes our solar system. It is burning up get this, 564 million tons of hydrogen per second. 564 million tons a second. 33,840,000,000 tons a minute. Over 2 trillion tons per hour and nearly 50 trillion tons a day. That's how much mass our sun is losing. That's a lot. (laughs) That's an awful lot. At that rate, if you go back in time 6,000 years ago, life is still very doable. Very, very similar. It's okay in comparison to where we're at today. But if you go back 50 million years, because a million's a lot. If you go back 50, 60, 70 million the, 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 if you add that mass to the sun, life on earth wouldn't be sustainable any longer. It'd be too hot. The sun's too large. It's too much. And then, of course, if you go back four billion years or whatever they want to today and tomorrow, we're, uh, four billion years, it would encompass where we're at in the solar system, actually, but let alone you know, be pulled into the gravitational pull of the sun itself. And so you can't just add more time to make something true. Consideration number three, the second law of thermodynamics or the law of entropy. This is not a theory. This is a law of science that all things go from, from um, order to disorder over time. That, that things, as you add time, they go from, from, from they get less complex You go from more complex to less complex. Things break down from more organized to less organized. Things just slowly run down over time. Now, I can just show you my photo album from like 20 years ago, and I can prove this point to you. Things have run down in my life, okay? And yours too. Consideration number four, and I know we're not spending too much time on this, but geological formations. No matter how you date geological items, there's, there's too much proof. If you have an open mind that things were formed quickly, suddenly. Fossils were formed quickly. That's how you create a fossil is, is, is sudden impact and pressure happening at once. And so that's why, you know, that you'll see like something like in the Grand Canyon, you see different layers of strata. Oftentimes you'll see a tree that's going right through it. What is, oh, this is 10 million years ago. That's 30 million years ago. This, or vice versa, this is 50 million years ago. And this tree is growing right up through it. This happens over and over and over again. 
Or, you know, you can, maybe you've seen this before, there's fossilized uh, items from humans and dinosaurs living simultaneously, all of that, right? You, geologically, you can't prove uh, the theory of evolution. And then fifthly, the fifth thing I'd like us to consider is macroevolution and natural selection. Merriam-Webster describes natural selection this way. A natural process that results in the survival and reproductive successes of individuals or groups best adjusted to their environment, and that leads to the perpetuation of genetic qualities best suited to that particular environment. Okay, most of us are, have a basic understanding of, na the, of natural uh, selection, this idea, this theory perpetuated by Charles Darwin. Now, what is ironic is that, to me, is that he was married to his first cousin. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. And it's actually, it's very tragic. I think he had 10 kids. I think only three survived childhood. And so he was kind of his own experiment in that way. But Darwin and the theory of natural selection, Darwinian evolution, had made this jump from microevolution, which is change, small change just within a species, right? He studied finches, and he noticed some finches have bigger beaks and some have smaller beaks and all that. And he made that jump from microevolution, which obviously we see it in dogs all the time. You can breed dogs to have certain characteristics. But he made that leap, which is too far of a leap to make to macro, what is called macro evolution, and that's change from one species into another. And from species to species, it, that, that can't happen. Uh, there's a, it's an older video series. It's called uh, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. Anybody ever see that old show? Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's great. Uh, the one creature that, that comes to my mind is giraffes. You know, giraffes have like this 25 pound heart. Can you picture that? That'd be fun to watch, right? If you're a hunter, that's like, that's good eating right there. So anyway, I, I'm not saying eat giraffe hearts, you know, hold on. I got to backtrack. But they've got this huge heart just pumping blood, just massive amounts of pressure to get blood throughout its long body, right? Well, when a giraffe goes down to get a drink of water, in theory, it's got this little pea brain at the end of that neck, all that pressure would literally like blow its brains out. And, but it's got this like feature, it's got this tissue or something around its brain that absorbs all of that pressure. That you can't, that can't happen by evolution. The first time it puts its head down, boom, no more giraffes, right? That <laughs> doesn't happen, right? So anyway, Darwin's theories have been treated like laws, his notions as knowledge, and his speculation is considered science today. But the problem is, is that Darwin, as he looked at these finches, he tried to explain design apart from and separate from a designer, and if you refuse to acknowledge a designer, it's going to take you places that you don't want to go. Now, you may or may not know that, you know, the title of his groundbreaking book, uh, most of us just say, oh, The Origin of Species. But that's not the full title of his book. It's The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or notice, or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And so, Part of uh, something I'm pretty passionate about, and um, I, if you have a take home, I hope this is one of those things this morning. But what I want to do in part is I want to point out what Darwin believed, what he wanted to point out, and the negative effects of his theory that we experience today. Now, Darwin taught macroevolution from one species to another, that different people groups and ethnicities evolved at different rates and at different times. And so some people groups, some ethnicities are more ape-like their ancestors than others. That's what Darwin taught. Now, who do you think that Darwin believed was the favored race? As Europeans, as Caucasians, right? Darwin, what I want you to know, and I will be preaching till the day I die, is that Darwinian evolution is an inherently racist philosophy that has caused the death and destruction of more human beings than we will ever experience of any other reason. Now, I, do, I try not to even use the word race 
because we're one human race. There's lots of ethnicities, but there's one human race. In fact, I would say that the word racism is racist because it's placing one below another. We're one human race. And so it's, it's an inherently racist philosophy that he came up with, this favored races, right? Now, it's no coincidence, as I tie some of these things together down to where we're living today, is that Darwin's younger cousin, a man that looked up to him, that you may have heard of as well, his name is Francis Galton, and he is the father of what is called the eugenics movement, Eugenics is a compound word two, made up of two Greek words, meaning good and origins, of good origins. It's a, it's a movement that's dedicated to restricting reproduction of those deemed undesirable, and it's a way to purify the gene pool. It's human breeding to further a favored race, Okay. And it's this line of thinking, if we jump ahead just a little bit, it's this line of thinking that, that brought us Hitler's Aryan nation and master race. There's a favored race. And so let's promote that. It's eugenics, okay? Well, Francis Galton, who is the cousin of Darwin, he was mentored by, he mentored a man named Havelock Ellis. And he too, if you take psychology classes or anything, you may have heard of Havelock Ellis. He wrote on the psychology of sex, and he also spent his life promoting the doctrine of eugenics. In fact, he wrote in 1912, he says, there must be a system to determine who are the most fit and the most unfit to carry on the human race. Now, understandably, it was within his lifetime, he didn't condemn the Nazis and their sterilization of, of population, he actually felt it was based on very scientific principles. Hitler's got some other stuff wrong with him, but that isn't one of them, okay? He, so we have Darwin to Galton to Havelock Ellis, he was the mentor and a lover of a woman named Margaret Sanger. In fact, he wrote in the preface of her book, Woman and the New Race, He's the one that wrote the preface to that book. Margaret Sanger, as you may very well be aware, is the founder of Planned Parenthood. And like Darwin, she believed in the preservation of favored races. Margaret Sanger once said that blacks are human weeds, recklessly breeding and spawning humans that should never be born. She's also quoted as saying, the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Planned parenthood is rooted and born in evolutionary racism. And I'm not convinced that that still isn't its intent. A 2010 census result revealed that 79% of Planned Parenthood surgical abortion facilities are within walking distance of African American and Hispanic neighborhoods. It's evil. It's wicked. If you try to take the designer out of this, it takes you places you don't want to go. If you turn to Romans chapter 1, now, evolution it's, it may have started as a concept and a theory, but I would say it's now a religion that requires faith to believe. It's taught, it's, it's implied, it's in our schools, and you have to have faith to believe it. But now our culture, our society, assumes it's true. By and large, we've accepted. I was just watching something the other day. I can't remember what it was. We were watching a show or, or something or a movie, and they were like trying to prove how backwards and dumb this guy was. And they're like, and he doesn't even believe in evolution. It's just implied that it's true. It's taught as a doctrine. Well, how did we get here? Just 200 years ago, science brings us nearer to God. Science and God, you know, they're necessary. That, that I, we learn about science because of God. How did we get to this point? Well, the answer is found in Romans chapter 1. It says in verse 18, Paul's making this case about how all man is guilty before God and that we're just spiraling out of control. He says, for the wrath of God, God's judgment 
is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress, if you have a different translation, it might say something else. I know the footnet, the footnote says to push down. I think that's a very just descriptive. I think it's someone in a pool, right? I'm just pushing them down. Like, you're not coming up, right? Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This is where it starts. This is how it started with Charles Darwin. He didn't want to be accountable to a holy and righteous and moral God. I'm going to suppress the truth. What's being suppressed? What's being held down? The truth about what? It's the truth about God. That God is clearly revealed. And Paul goes on to say, he's clearly revealed two ways. Number one, he's revealed in our conscience. Verse 19, because what we what may be known of God is manifest in them. It's manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. We know that we know there's a God. We just do. Now, we may callous our conscience. We may suppress it. We may push that down. But we know that we know. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. We know. I'm an eternal being. A man by the name of Don Richardson wrote a book called Eternity in Their Hearts. And he's someone that traveled all over the world to all these remote tribes. And what he discovered is everyone gets it. They all get it. There's a God. They understand. There's eternity in their hearts. And so number one, we know by our conscience. Number two, Paul says, we know by creation. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and godhood, so that they are without excuse. Paul says, every man knows by conscience and creation. It's understood, it's revealed, it's manifest within them, and it's understood and revealed in the things that are made. Verse 21 goes on to say, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. That's such a powerful statement. You're not not glorifying God. You're not thankful. Here's the other option. Futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Oh, I'm so wise. I'm so intellectual. I can suppress God. No, you're futile. Now your foolish heart is darkened. Now you, you don't get it. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, that's a reason word, because all of this is true, that man has had God revealed to him by his conscience and through creation, but suppress the truth. They, they profess to be wise, but they're made fools. They've got darkened hearts. Therefore, because that's true, God also gave them up. That's what you want? That's how you want it? God's not going to force our affection, our obedience, our love. That's what you want? God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, speaking about homosexuality, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. I'll take the lie, because I don't want to be submissive to God. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. That's the spiral. It's worshiping the creature. What's the creature? It's us. I'm going to worship humanity. Look at this evolutionary process. We're going to become, you know, we just keep following this thing now. You know, we create our own destiny, so to speak. Worshiping the creatures more than the creator. And so why is evolution, how did we get from the 1800s where, you know, science supports Christianity and Christianity supports science and they work hand in hand to where we're at today? It's because mankind is rebellious, This is how we got. This is the answer to that second question. This is how we got to where we are today. Is that mankind doesn't want a God, that God, to rule over us. I want to live autonomous. I want to be separate from him. I don't want him. I'm going to suppress the truth. But if we try to explain our existence outside of a creator, outside of a designer, it affects our life in drastic, drastic ways. Everything in our life, every day, is affected by this. 
Now, this is just a small sample size, but in 1963, 60 years ago, and in the scope of, uh, of history, it's not very long at all, but in 1963, prayer and, and Bible reading was taken out of schools. It used to be a regular part of your average school day was prayer at the public school and to read the Bible. It's 1963, that was taken out of the public school system. Since that point, sexually transmitted diseases have raised over 250%. Violent crimes is nearly 1,000%. Preteen pregnancy is up over 500%. Divorce up over 200%. When we remove God from our life and say, I don't want him, I'm going to suppress the truth, it's bad for us. But, but if I want a theory that separates, you know, if I have a theory that separates me from him, that I'm just an accident, that some, by some fortuitous chain of events, I became who I am, that becomes attractive if I just want to live like an animal. If I just want to gratify my flesh, I want to do this, I want to do this, and I have to suppress him. There's no other choice. I have to say no to God. I want to do what feels natural. I don't want to have a, a guilt-ridden conscience. Right? There's no freedom found in that. There's no true life. And if that's you here today, there's nothing there. There's no hope found in that. Could you turn to Psalm 139? But that's the, you know, that's the worldview that our enemy is perpetuating, and it is to keep us from God. It's to keep us from fellowship with him. You don't need him. Go ahead. You, know, you can come up with a different way. God is antiquated. Evolution doesn't explain our origins. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and in the image of God, he created them male and female. That explains our origins. It explains our origins. It explains our purpose. It explains our destiny. You and I, every single person in this room, and maybe you don't feel like it right now, but every single person was made on purpose and for a purpose by a God who loves you. Look at Psalm 139. Let's begin in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a biblical worldview. How did I get here? I have a loving God that individually, that's the idea here. It's not like I just created people. It's individually, uniquely, specifically, with thought and intention, created me. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. Notice verse 17, how precious are your thoughts towards thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, count what? God's precious thoughts towards me. If I should count them, they'd be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. You and I, the people that you're going to meet this week, are not the effect of some primordial junk drawer spilled out over time with no purpose. You are not an accident. That's a message that the world needs to hear. You're not an accident. God loves you. You're special. You're unique. There's a purpose for your life. That's what we want to hear, and it's the biblical worldview. You were made on purpose on purpose, not on purpose. You were made on purpose, and you were made for a purpose. I'm going to have you turn one more place. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. While you're turning there, I'm going to read to you Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. All these thoughts, these innumerable precious thoughts God has for you, they're thoughts of peace and not of evil 
They're to give you a future and a hope. This is where it's in the biblical worldview. It's a biblical understanding of who God is and what he thinks of me. That's where fulfillment is found. If I can understand that I'm not here by chance, and I also understand, though, that I'm accountable He's a sovereign God. He has a say in my life, but I also understand that I have been created on purpose for a purpose. Then I begin to live with purpose. Notice what it says, Ephesians 2, we begin in verse 8, and Paul's just describing, you know, the wretchedness that we have, that God saves us by grace. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we, you and I, friends, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word workmanship is so great. It's so rich. It's so deep. You you can hear it. The Greek word is poema. We're the poem of God. You could translate that word masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. You're incredible. Because God has created you on purpose, with purpose, for a purpose, to do good works. He created you with a plan. Not pointless, not Seinfeld-ish. There's a purpose and a point to your life. Colossians 1.16 says, we were created by him and for him. We were created to glorify God. And that's the message we get to share. And I'm going to challenge you to share it. Jesus didn't come and die for a bunch of accidents. He came for those that he deems special, unique, precious. So whether you're uh, in management or maintenance or taxes, teaching, taxidermy, whatever else you want to throw in here, whatever it is, if you're doing that, you're created by him in form. If you're doing that for the God that created you, I'm going to show you a person that's living with purpose, that's living with joy in their life, that are thankful, not futile. They understand what life is about. And so It's one of the things that we're going to continue to discover as we make this journey through Genesis is that God created you, he seeks a relationship with you, and he has a wonderful plan and purpose for your life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that your word is so true. Lord, the the doctrines and the ideologies that have been thrown at humanity can be so wicked, so evil, Lord, but your truth changes not because you change not. Lord, there's no shadow of turning with you. I'm so thankful, Lord, and I pray that as we continue to, di- to discover and understand who you are, that we'd understand ourselves as great, as holy, as majestic, and magnificent as you are, Lord, we're precious to you. We were created intentionally by you. I thank you, Lord. I pray that we would live in that purpose. Whatever our roles, whatever our occupations may be, but that we'd be those that are living for you, living lives of worship. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us the courage, the wisdom and discernment by your spirit to share this message of hope with the world around us. Thank you, Jesus. We love you so much. We pray this in your name. Amen.